giving us an overview about the situation uh, in Malaysia now, particularly related to the Malays and also Islam under the Pakatan Harapan correlation. And I made a very interesting point about the intersection uh, between uh, religion and uh, the way people practice religion as well as the, uh, the socio-economic indicators, uh, which I think is a very important point. So we have about uh, 45 minutes now for, for questions and answers. Oh, I see so many hands. <laughs> okay. um, let's take a few rounds of questions, maybe uh, three questions per round. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Um, maybe we go this way. Yeah? So, uh, we have this. Uh, and we from NUS. I guess the tragedy is that Al Ataturk didn't have the oil, the Saudis had the oil, because Turkey used to be so clean. But a point, of, a local point, if in fact as it looks, oh no pass will come in next time, how do you evaluate the influence of Jairi Kamaluddin? Because he's United World College, he's Oxford, and he's also the Boris Johnson of the place. He was boasting at school that one day he'd be prime minister. I know because he was a classmate of my grandson. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, is he in fact, because he, Oxford, UIC, he's very well educated and he's very pushy. Do you feel that he would have a positive influence if Omno gets, Omno pass? You said that yes, Islam has been propelled to the center stage in the last five years or so. Um, you also said that it's the economy, stupid. It's, it's about the economy. But then if you go back further, um, where do you place the Bumiputra policy? Because that was meant to solve this particular issue at the very start of Malaysia for that matter and then comes along this Islam and identity which you mentioned the book by Francis Fukuyama so it all get mixed up in the last what 10 years or so it doesn't help that Islam is being used by the, the political parties at that time you know for their own political interests so I'm, I'm a bit incoherent in, in the way I, I say things you, maybe you want to explain a little more thanks I want to ask you, because you at the start you talked about your hypothesis, you mentioned about the worsening situation raised in religious matters in correlation with economic disparity. I was wondering if you could talk more about that, because you talked about, a lot about economic disparity, but I think um, there's not much about how this actually correlates to racial and religious matters over the past few years. And to bring on to uh, Adam Sujadi's point, if you talk about um, identity is being something that's recent. We see that um, in Malaysia over the past 20 years, ever since Mahathir has become Prime Minister, Islamization has become up and front center, and it's all about the economy. So how is your argument and this hypothesis different from what has already been done for the past 20 plus years so far? I'd, I'd like more explication on that, thanks. Uh, for the first question about this uh, Amno and Pass, uh, you know, if they, tend, if they manage to collaborate and form uh, a single party, and According to my calculation, right, my calculation, if you look at the previous uh, uh, general election, G14, you will see that uh, PH won 122 seats, right? The opposition won 98 seats. So if you look at my slides just now, I said that there were 30 seats which are basically going to, uh, basically it was because of past and UMNO, they con contested separately, but if they were to combine, they will form the majority. And this 36. So if you add all, 98 plus 30 is going to be 128. Right? And Pakatan is 122. If they remain, or if, if they're going to lose this, uh, what do you call? Um, the 36, they're definitely going to lose the, the next generation. That's simple calculation. And there was also a question raised yesterday whether, you know, this uh, uh, one uh, political scientist who, may, who said that, you know, what's the look? going to be in the next general election. You know, I say that it's going to be bleak, very bleak, if I'm not in past corporate. That's why they didn't buy the bait by to Dr. Mother, you know. And that's why Dr. Mother also wanted to basically to get as many people to cross over uh, to Basatu, right? Basically because he knew that, you know, if there's not a strong Malay-based uh, Malay party that could lead the government, 
you know, they're going to lose. PKR is basically, uh, it's imploding, right? It's imploding with all these uh, scandals uh, cropping up now and then, and you know, like, you don't even know whether they're really, really into politics or they into something else. <laughs> So I don't see. So when question about Kairi Jawade, to be honest, I texted uh, a cousin of mine who is a good friend, a close friend of Kairi. I said, you know, you have to rethink about your association and basically because he did not want to come up to go head to head against Zahid Amidi. And now Zahid was basically being charged with, you know, like, what, how many hundred of, of charges? He's still leading uh, Amo. He's back. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> He's back to, to basically to lead Amo. So I think that, you know, if he's willing to stand against Zahid, uh, I don't know whether he will win or not, because as to what Tomate said years ago, in Amo, they don't want clever people. They don't want those from Oxford, Oxford to be there. Okay. That's very unfortunate for Kairi. He's in the wrong party, I think, if you ask. They don't want clever people there. Yeah? And about the, the second question about this uh, Sujai Sudeti, yeah? Yeah. about this, uh, what happened to this Gurpura policy? That's what you're, you're saying. It was there since 1970. You see, the thing is that it was during Tun Abdul Razak time, right? And Tun Abdul Razak, during his student days, he studied in the UK. He was a leader of the socialist uh, student movement in, in, in the UK. So when he came back to Malaysia, you know, he has this socialist idea. So when he became the Prime Minister, you know, his whole idea, idea was basically to empower the, the poor, you know, to make less economic disparity. So he came up with this, uh, you know, post uh, this 1969 racial riots. He knew that one of the main reasons for this racial riot was basically economic inequality. So he came up with this brilliant idea of NEP, New Economic Policy. Now, probably we have to rethink, should New Economic Policy be race-based or not? Yeah? Or need space? And, and I gave a recent interview to a diplomat uh, which I said in my interview that, you know, we have to move from race-based to needs-based because there's still pockets of poor Chinese in, in the urban areas, right? And, and I think that, you know, even though uh, we say it's needs-based, even though that doesn't mean that we're going to neglect the majority, the Malays. Because as I showed you in my graph just now, B40, the majority of them are Malays. So if you say that we're going to have this policy to be needs-based, we're going to address the grievances of the Malays. Because they form the majority of the B40. So I think we have to basically, even though we change the policy, but we must... The real problem was after Tum Razak, you know, it became more of chronic capitalism type of policy at the time. You know, is I think it was somewhat deviated from the noble uh, intention of, of Tuna Raza. And that's why we created uh, a few, uh, what do you call, millionaires or billionaires among the Malays. The idea was this new uh, neoliberal agenda, right? Neoliberal agenda which says that, you know, if you manage to create a group of uh, elites, um, basically the, the rich elites, then the uh, wealth to trickle down to the poor. That, that's the whole idea. Well, that's the idea that, that I think was the idea after Turaza, right? After Turaza, uh, maybe Tuna Tomaze, he believed in that. So he created a few uh, Malay capitalists, right? Uh, they became rich. But, you know, the thing is that even though the theory was there, that the, that the wealth, it would trickle down to the poor, but in actual sense, it didn't happen. You know why? One reason, greed. Greed, greed is the, the problem, right? Human <coughs> greed. So once you get rich, you don't really care about the poor. So that's, that's my criticism about this neoliberal agenda, right? And um, about Shafiq, he asked about uh, economic disparity, right? And 
What was the main trust? Identity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's a little bit uh, difficult to really um, uh, explain the 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 because it's interlinked. I would say that you know identity pol politics uh, basically whether we like it or not, you know people tend to have this, you know, like what Francis Fukuyama said that you know it it, it has, um when you ask some people like are you Malaysian first or Malay first, you know, the answer is Malay first because because that's the identity politics of it, and and that's the real problem that we have to address as well. So I I do not think that. You know, like uh, it should be focused on one. Yes, I say that the main focus, the main trust, would be to alleviate the economic disparity, right? But doesn't mean that we have to shun, you know, any effort to try and dilute these uh, issues of inclusion of literal Islam and so on and so forth. We have to go. Uh, we have to try and sort everything out, and we have to move uh, towards basically uh, giving a new narrative. About, about Islam, about what is progressive Islam. It's not the, the type of Islam that is promoted <coughs> by the previous regime of, of Najib, uh, which was basically, to him, this uh, literary Islam was basically good because the idea of literary Islam was basically you cannot go against a government, you cannot go against a ruler as long as the ruler performs prayer, performs salat. Right. You cannot go against Aaron. So irrespective of whether he's corrupt or not, if he performs salat, you have to be obedient to him. You is haram, right? Is is forbidden for you to go against such a leader. It's un-Islamic. So to Najib is good. You know, this that's why he he gave money for them, right? For this uh, literal Islam to prosper. And that's why he has this uh, special link with Saudi Arabia as well. Yeah. That, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. My question is, why Bumi Putra does not perform well in the economy? Second question related to the economic inequality and local identity. What is the relevance? Is there any relevance of Sharia or eco Islamic economics in Malaysia? With, uh, this Islamic economics or Shah economics will help the Pumi Putra and the local identity. Thank you. When I first uh, heard your, your theory about um, income disparity and, um, and cut across the racial lines, um, it gives me the impression that, that um, the solution will have to be racial also. Yes. Well, of course, you qualify it as a unique case. But that's not the case. In the case, uh, even with Pakistan Harapan, the dominant thinking is still the solution is going to be a racial solution. And then, uh, you know, the racial solution is always used as an ideology of a certain class of people uh, to, uh, to, to maintain their privileges. I remember this need based thing was, was proposed by Professor Echenaretas in 1969 when he was a, uh, he was a leader of Rakan. And uh, Tun Raza doesn't care about it. And he knows it because. Uh, this we put our policy for the very beginning is always being used as a, as a, as an ideology to enhance the privileged groups, and and the new Pakatan uh, Harapan group is not going to let it go. Pakatan uh, Raya is not going to let it go because uh, they have to lose all these things. But the moment they go to the mass politics, it becomes a, a racial thing. At the top level, it's pretty multiracial in a sense. Uh, the privileged groups are quite multiracial, but the moment it goes down to the to the political level, it becomes a it becomes a communal in a sense. I remember that uh, once uh, we had a discussion with the uh, DAP boss, uh, and when he was here in Singapore, and then uh, the the argument is that uh, at the top level, in terms of the level of corruption, things like that, uh, privileges, collusions, is very much multiracial. But the moment it goes down. And he agreed to that. This Katuan and Nayu is red pattern. The real issues actually is at the top level. Uh, is a, is a ideology that maintain the privileged groups. That is uh, uh, the argument. So 
I think if you look at the solution differently, then uh, uh, we'll have a, we'll, we may have the answer to it. Uh, you are right in the sense that base uh, need base, but if you look at the the rhetoric, uh, it's still very much a, a, a racial thing. Uh, the second thing is that um, you mentioned about how Islam will have to uh, the use of Islam to to, to solve some of the problems. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical, but uh, when you start to use Islam on the theological base, that means if you start arguing that uh, well we don't want the Salafis when we have a different type of Islam. The moment you get engage Islam in theological base, you are transferring the authority of that theological discourse to the clerics. And the moment the clerics uh, come to the center of your discourse, then you have what you have now. Uh, you must get that out from the clerics, and the only way to do that is to, to talk about Islam, not in a theological sense, but on ethics, on, on, on morality, which is very universal in, in that sense. And as you said, you don't even have to talk about Islam. You talk about fundamental values of justice, equality, things like that. But the moment you try to attack one uh, as being a Salafis, and you propose another form of theological thinking, you actually relegated uh, the whole responsibility to the clerics. And, 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 and I don't think there's a solution to that. Thank you so much for your um, presentation. Uh, I think there's um, some aspects that uh, have been overlooked. And I think one uh, missing piece of this puzzle about why there's anxiety is that we need to get to, you know, what are the specific policy instruments that have a massive outreach. Um, and so going beyond income in the allocation of uh, higher uh, education opportunities through MARA, you have microfinance, you have the GLC, the employment, I think these are ones that also not only touch on the B40, but a significant proportion of the middle 40. And I would dispute the, the assessment that the Bumiputras have by and large not benefited. Actually, they have extensively benefited, specific, but we need to be specific in the sense that they have received allocation, this preferential allocation of opportunities. Where it has fallen short, maybe, yes, ultimately leading to income, but fallen short in terms of giving them that uh, in inculcating that self-confidence and capability. And I think that is the root of why there is anxiety and insecurity, because they're not at that stage yet of being able to countenance the fact that uh, the, pros the prospect that it can be, uh, the preference can be uh, removed. So, but this is also related to my question in the context of the, uh, what's happening right in the, in the public sphere. This is increasing assertiveness of many NGOs, you know, which at least are helmed, and I think the membership and support would be very broad-based, but would be helmed by a lot of uh, urban Malay uh, professionals. Uh, it's, it's a broad question, you know, how do you, yeah, what, what do you see are the, you know, the, the underlying uh, reasons and, and the trend? Is it just going to uh, continue growing, and, and how would um, Islamic Renaissance Front uh, insert itself in, in, in those uh, uh, discourses? And also related to that, um, do you see any uh, salient uh, trends in, uh, on, in, in the government, in, in the Islamist uh, machinery within, within uh, the government, right? I mean, it continually is very uh, substantially uh, funded, but in terms of, yeah, you know, how the, the internal discourses that, that, that we are not really uh, following, there's not so much reported that you may be aware of. Uh, what does that signal for, for the future in, in terms of the uh, official uh, enforcement of Islam? First, why the Buddha did not do well, right? Uh, despite, you know, years of uh, um, government policies that, that basically favours uh, favor them, right? Why they didn't do well? I think um, this, to me, like, you know, there are so many reasons, but one of the main reasons to me was the policies itself, because uh, as I mentioned to you about this uh, new liberal policy that was adopted by the previous regime, was uh, basically fraud, yeah, basically fraud, because uh, not only it uh, enriches a certain group of, uh, of um, Buibu Trust, but um, uh, it also created this uh, kind of uh, 
uh, what do you call lazy Malays, you know, lazy Malay businessmen. Why I say that is that because if you look at you know, so many contracts uh, that were being handed out by the governments, right, you know, for Bulbutra to apply for that contract, yeah, they will apply for that contract by using a Bulbutra company, right? But then the work is going to be done by non bumis right? Everything is being done by non bumis So they just sat there and they got the money. So they're lazy, okay? These lazy Malays. So, yeah, I, I don't want to argue about the myth of the, <laughs> the lazy Malays. But, but the thing is that, yeah, basically we're creating that, that kind of, of group, of mentality of people, right? They are not, um, and this is the thing that Dr. Mazay wanted to read out from the Malays. Yeah? He wanted them to work hard, yeah? but not many Malays wanted to work hard. Even if you look at the younger generation, you know, they prefer to work uh, 9 to 5, you know, rather than uh, to work hard, to put extra effort and to, to um, basically to contribute to the economic and to the society as well. So that's, that's a real problem. The real problem, I think, you know, it was the policy itself and it was within the Miputra, right? Both, both ways. And uh, you're talking about, about uh, the Sharia and the economy and, you know, if, um, uh, I, if I understand you correctly, that uh, what you're trying to say whether it plays any role in, in, in our economy or not. Malaysia wanted to be the hub of uh, of uh, what is known as the Islamic banking and so on and so forth, right? But uh, having said that, Singapore also wanted to be uh, an economic hub for for Islamic banking, isn't it? My contention, I have said this many times. You know, you cannot change an economy to become an Islamic economy just by renaming it, just by renaming Mubar uh, with Arabic terms. Uh, Mudaraba, Musharaka, and so on, suddenly it tend to become Islamic. No, it's the content. What is inside that, right? That's the most important thing. It's not to relabel it and to rename it. I believe that everything that people say, okay, this is Islamic medicine. What is Islamic medicine? To me, you know, many universities have, uh, before, before this, many universities, uh, um, asked me to give lectures to the medical students right, about Islamic medicine. So I went there and I said, you know, the most important thing for you to understand Islamic medicine is that Islamic medicine is medicine, basically, is evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is the modern medicine, right? Modern medicine is actually Islamic medicine. Islamic medicine is not, it's not about, you know, like, uh, what do you call? Some uh, reciting, uh, recitations of some doa or some verses or something like that. Or being able to to uh, heal some uh, possession uh, by the genes or something like that. No, that's not Islamic medicine. It's evidence-based medicine. It's ethics in medicine. And that is Islamic medicine, right? Of course, after that, they don't want to call me again, to invite me again <laughs> to give talks. Same, same thing, similar thing with, with economy as well. To me, it's not the name. You know, you don't have to say, okay, this is Islamic banking. Okay, you use this uh, Mutaraba or Musharaka or whatever. Okay, at the end of it, so we have managed to eliminate Riba. I have argued with them. If you look, you know, now probably they have changed, right? But during the earlier years, the Islamic banking system was worse than the conventional system. Right? In terms of the profit margin of the economic, uh, of the banking system. It was worse than the conventional system. Right? I do not want to elaborate further, but I have a graph to show that, you know, how much interest rate um, expanding 30 years as compared from Islamic banking <coughs> to the conventional banking. The thing is that it's the spirit of of Islam that should be there. It's the ethics, right? If you don't if you don't have that, then there's no point in doing this, right? It's about ethics. That's the most important thing. And uh, oh yeah, it is. You give me a very tough question. <laughs> uh, 
I do not say actually that you know we have to argue on Islam on the theological basis. I basically say that you know I'm not trying to say that you know to combat uh, the literal Islam we have to come up with the new narration of uh, progressive Islam. No, I'm not saying that. You know, this contestation is going to go on and on. You know, we you cannot. Uh, it won't end. You know, there's no end, right? If you look at the trend now in 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 uh, of Islam, of the strains of Islam in Malaysia, and I think in many parts of the world as well, I would say there were three camps. Okay, there were three camps. One would be the conservatives. These form the majority of the Malays in in Malaysia. They are the uh, what in in theological term we call it the Ashaira and the Shafi'iyah. You know. In, in, in theological term. So they are basically like, oh, to, to make it clearer for you to uh, to visualize or to, to have a, a vision of what I meant by conservative Islam, just look at this figure. Harus Sani or Nah Gadud in Johor or Harus Sani, the Mufti of Perak, okay? They are what I call the, the, the um, these people basically epitomize the what is known as this conservatism. Second would be this uh, revisionist or literal literalism, right? And we know that they're gaining force, <coughs> right? And because Najib believed that, you no, know, they serve his purpose to maintain his political, uh, uh, basically, power, then, you know, he gave them a lot of space. And they even, some of them even were uh, included in the uh, youth, uh, UMNO Youth Council, right? The these leaders of, of this uh, ulama muda UMNO, the young scholars of UMNO. And they were 100% Salafis, right? They were 100% Salafis. And the thing is that they came up with a version that is very virulent in a way that, you know, they, they have this, yesterday I mentioned in Tarawa Akam, they have this historical term known as Al Walla Al Barak, the term of allegiance and disavowal. Meaning to, say, meaning to say that you pledge allegiance to those of the same faith and disavow al-bara with you know, anything not associated with Islam. With Christians, with Jews, with uh, Buddhists, and, and so on and so forth. And because of this, this very virulent ideology, now, for the past few years, people have been arguing whether you can wish Merry Christmas to your Christian friends or not. <laughs> It came from this particular ideology, okay, al wala wal ideology. And of course, the third strain would be the reformist strain, right? And I'm basically one of the uh, propagator of, of, this, of this particular strain. Trying to reconcile Islam and the 21st century. Trying to say that, you know, Islam is compatible to the 21st century. And, and I think this contestation between the three groups will be going on and on. No, it's never going to end, right? It started a long time ago. It was at its peak during the Cambodia Kaum Tour. If you know a little bit about history, uh, in the early 2000, right? Um, and there was some of them were from Singapore as well, such as Hadi, this Zamba, and, and a few others. And and you know now is is going on, right? So I'm not saying that, uh, Idris, I'm not saying that, you know, you have to get to discourse about ideology and then finally the clerics will take over everything. No, I'm trying to say that, you know, like, we have to talk about, about basically about these values. These Islamic values which are universal values. We don't have to name it or label it as Islam, basically. It's just universal values that can be accepted with everyone. Whether they are Muslims, whether they are Christians or Buddhists, they can accept it. And uh, about Ho'an, uh, you're asking about Islam in, in the government, is it? The current one? The, the, can you like... Oh, the, the, the assertiveness of, of NGOs, especially of conservative. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, you know, your thoughts and comments on that. Yeah. yeah. The, the thing is that, you know, like uh, when, when the new government, when they came to power, they formed what is known as the CEP. Council of Eminent Persons, right? This Council of Eminent Persons form a few other groups, right? Uh, committees. 
So they have these uh, institutional reforms, they have judiciary reforms, they have, you know, and one of the committees will be on religious reform. And I was in that committee. There were initially five of us in that, in that uh, religious reform committee. And uh, of course, subsequently, there were like six or seven of us in, in that religious reform committee, including the uh, famous Mufti of Perlis, Dr. Asri Zainal Abidin, whom uh, Shari said why he has tend to become, you know, <laughs> like a right-wing uh, proponent. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, whatever that we propose to the government for a change of, of this government has been stored, you know, in the cold storage. You know, nobody knows. Right? I do not think that, you know, they, they have the courage or the, uh, how do I say, they, they, they are not, strong enough to say that we have to change the status quo. For example, Jakim used to receive almost one billion budget, right? And the current Jakim, there's no reshuffle at all, right? They're still receiving one billion budget. And what have they been, have, what have they been doing, right? They question that, right? So I do not think that they, even though they, there's a tagline of the new government wanted to say Islam as Ramadan and al right? right? Um, you know, it's for the entire universe. It's uh, blessings for the entire universe. But uh, it remains as a concept. You know, people have yet to see any improvement. Uh, if you go, to, or if you attend any Friday sermons, then you will see that, you know, in Friday sermons, they would vilify, you know, what they term as liberal Islam, the Shiites, and the, uh, you know, Ahmadis, and so on and so forth. So, nothing much has changed. So, to me, there's no political will of the current government to initiate change uh, in, in the policies with regard to religion itself. Dr. Mafaro, uh, yeah. thank you for giving us a clear illustration of what's happening. I have two questions. First, related to the talk about changing the government and the system. When Pakatan Harapan won the election, it is well known that they were there to make an attempt to change the system, if not to change the system. But so far, the reality is that political leaders were the product of the system. Whichever system you go through, you have to follow that. So in the case of Pakalan Harapan, they found that the current situation, which is not uh, well received, could not be changed simply because the system is too strong. So they became the product. They have to follow what has been done by the previous government. So, what is there the hope for the voters in the future if they see that there is no change happening under Bakata Garapan? My second question related to the development of human capital. I had been uh, attending or going to visit this uh, international book exhibition at World Trade Center for the past 10 years. One very clear change that I saw last year was that the number of uh, publishers selling Islamic books have increased so much. They, over, they took one whole floor of the four floors of the World Trade Center. I asked them and they said that there has been a massive increase of interest among the young Malaysian Muslim to study Arabic and Islam. In terms of development of human capital, how do you see this trend of Islamic-based studies and the product that will live into the labor market in the future? And which direction that this development will take Malaysia into? Thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Farouk. Thank you for your questions. I learned a lot. Um, I have two questions related. One of them is a follow-up with Mr. Idris' question. So you kind of mentioned just now in your presentation about the politics of fear. And I wonder whether, you know, I mean, when we talk about the politics of fear, it's also due to the systemic racialization of society that makes these political strategies to be effective. And you also mentioned that addressing economic grievances can alleviate fears and anxieties of Malays who feel left behind. So I wonder what is the Pakatan government doing to actually counter this uh, racialized these causes or religionized these causes? Or are they actually, in fact, reinforcing these lines? So my question, second question is kind of related. Um, 
I understand the appeal of Islam and its politicization is actually more effective amongst the lower income, as you mentioned. I mean, if we talk about the economic disparity, it actually affects the lower income at least more. And that's why, you know, Islam um, by past and by UMNO seems to be very effective. So I'm actually just wondering, among the middle income, the upper income of Malays, um, could you talk more about the appeal of Islam amongst them? Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Mayuko. I'm a reporter from a Japanese newspaper, Nikkei. And thank you for the talk. Um, I just would like to find out um, your thoughts on the um, the policies by Makata and Halapan um, going forward to, to uh, running up to the next gen um, general election. Um, I hear from the, the, the minority groups uh, talking about um, how Mahathir administration's policies are moving towards more um, Malay-friendly, um, inclined to the Malay-friendly type of policies because um, they're, they're facing the threat from the UMNO and PAS, um, you know, the uh, possible coalition. Um, do you think this will continue and deepen? Um, and if so, um, what will be the possible choice that voter will be given in the next election? Will it be more, uh, you know, less of the, the, the alternative type of the choice that is given to them, especially for the minorities? Right, thank you. Um, well, Mr. Yatiman, um, you're asking about um, what will happen if there's no change. There's been this talk among Malaysians to say that you know this Pakatan government is a one-term government. It's no need to be in power for one term. And you know this is to me it's very worrying trend that uh, you know if uh, this cryptocratic government of Najib is going to come back to power. So basically they have to first to try and sort this issue of, of uh, this uh, the trial of Najib and, and many others. And, and secondly, of course, they have to basically be wary of, of certain things. Of the one is of these ethnic tensions that you heard about the story of this Adib, the fireman. Right? So it has created a lot of problems. And I'm sorry to say this, but because this is close to a meeting, I have to voice out my grievances as well. And I had written about it. And I, to be honest, I was not very happy with the way the Minister of uh, Harmony is, uh, you know, is, uh, is doing, basically. I think, you know, um, he was creating basically, you know, more problems in ethnic relations than trying to solve the problems among the different ethnicities in, 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 in Russia. And I think that the government, Mahathir himself, or the Mahathir, he has to do something about it, right? He has to basically try and solve this particular issue because, you know, like, even the economic issues such as uh, GST, people thought that, you know, when they abolish GST, that you know, this is going to be a market improvement in the economic situation of the country. But you no, know, it didn't turn out to be that way. And they wanted to abolish toll. Then they realized that you know, they couldn't do that as well. They wanted to, uh, how do I say, they wanted to, a few other things that they pledged, uh, PTPTN, the, the study loan, right? They did manage to do that as well. So there are a lot of things that they pledge during their, their election campaign in their manifesto. Of course, it's not it's not uh, gospel, you know, something written uh, basically that you must uh, basically fulfill all the manifesto promises. But actually, but you must at least think reasonably well before saying that you could do that, right? Basically, do uh, an analysis of whether it's feasible or not. They wanted to basically terminate all the contracts with the, what they think was an uneven contracts with the Chinese companies. But that didn't happen as well, right? So the ECRL, which was to me and to many other economists, well-known economists like Professor Jomo, who believe that it's unnecessary to have ECRL because it did not serve any good purpose for the Malay Malaysian government or for the Malaysian population except for the Chinese agenda, 
Uh, you know, it's still on. So, you know, these are the problems. And, and people have to assess about, about all these uh, problems. And um, I'm sad to say that the only thing that we can be happy about is that we can we manage to get rid of Najib for a while. Right? <laughs> that's, that's the only thing that we're happy. We can be happy that you know, there are less corruption in, in the government. I'm not saying that there's no corruption, but it's significantly less. less right? We don't see any more these vestiges, uh, this uh, what you call when every year the audit would come up and saying that you no, know, oh, this is not being done properly. That we wasted, you know, how many hundred millions of this and that. We have, we have not had that yet. You know, so we will see how it goes. But I hope for the best uh, for this government to change and to improve. We only have another you know, three to four years here yeah, to 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 improve. And we hope, you know, there's, there's going to be an improvement. And um, about this uh, development of human capital, that's, that's a good question, basically. Because, uh, strangely, that, you know, like, uh, even my contemporaries, right, well-educated Malay Muslims, uh, they like to send their children to all these Islamic schools, right? And... and in the end, what's going to be, you know? We have an influx of, of these students from abroad, from who came back from Saudi Arabia, from Jordan, from Egypt, who basically infiltrated into the, not infiltrated, we absorbed, <laughs> being absorbed into the government agencies, right? We absorbed the government agencies, Jakim, Jais, Jawi, Ma'is, all kind of names, right? You, you sometimes you don't even know whether this thing exists or not. Yadim, I, Yapim, I, I don't know, you know, like all these uh, being, basically they were the ones who were going to handle all these uh, agencies. And that's why you see that, you know, there are a lot of things that were not being done um, accordingly because, some or other, because they put a different priority on, on certain things, right? Like for example, like we heard of this, uh, what do you call uh, uh, this Tabu uh, Haji, uh, right? The the for Hajj, right? So they they wasted a lot of money on 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 things which are unrelated to Hajj, for example. Or this uh, this uh, another Yasan that was established to help the poor, right? What happened to the money? They used the money to to buy uh, some cough uh, simulation or things like that and spend money on overseas uh, uh, trade. So these are the things, some of the things that I think, even though they are religious, but some people can get corrupt because of wealth, right? And that's the issue that we have to address. And I do not think that it's going to be good for the government in the future to have a lot of Islamic study students. I think we should, like what Dr. Mahathir wanted, was that we have to get more people to engineering, medicine, architecture, and all these professional programs. Uh, and, and I think that he has this idea why we have to have, uh, you know, this teaching of English and math, in, 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 in uh, teaching of uh, science and math in English. It was basically to uh, improve the, uh, basically is the language. <laughs> it's the scientific language of science and, and mathematics. If you go to university, all the UC uh, books, whether they are they are about computer science, whether they are about engineering, about uh, medicine, everything is written in English. You know, you cannot say that. You know, some of these Malay uh, activists were saying that. You know, how could uh, countries like Japan prosper when when uh, you know um, or Germany prosper when they are learning in their native language? They are learning in Japanese or in in, in German. You know, I, <coughs> my argument was that, look at those countries. We have DPP, we have this Dewan uh, Bahasa dan Pustaka, and we have this uh, another penterjemah. Uh, what is it called? Uh, in translation. Institute ITB, yeah, Institute Terjemah ITM, Institute Terjemah, to translate into Malay. But what do they translate? They translate a biography of Najib. <laughs> they translated this biography of Najib rather than you know, scientific books. We don't have any scientific books in Malay. Right? 
I have seen some of the students when before I was in Monash, I was in the like Hong Kong, we were in in the, uh, what do you call local university. I was in USM, and I saw them reading. You know, they have the the English textbook here, and they have a dictionary over here. <laughs> they're reading here and they're looking at the dictionary. You know, how difficult was learning of Mandarin? Because simply because you do not master the language. I think yesterday I spoke with Dr. Alkam. I said the thing is that you no know, years ago, hundreds of years ago, uh, in the in Europe, the Europeans were learning Arabic, right? Why? Because they wanted to translate the book by you know by uh, Ibn Ibn Sina, uh, by Ibn Rush, by Al Khawarizmi on 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 mathematics and everything, Al Biruni into the into Latin and uh, you know, into into the Western language, and these Muslim scholars learn Latin to translate from Latin to 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 Arabic. So that's how it is. Unfortunately or fortunately. The, the the language of uh, the language of science and technology now is English, so you have to master English, and that's why Dr. Ma they wanted. I know your system is better, much much better than Malaysia. You know we wanted to move that, but you know with all this kind of Malaysia um, ideologues, you know they they still want to visit. Oh no, we have to learn everything English. No, I I was in Europe. I was in train in Germany. You know they have this uh, what they call it this train. Uh, I forgot the name. They call it this train. Autobahn. Autobahn, yeah. Autobahn. So I was there and I was in the coach, and there was this lady in front of me, sitting, and he was reading a novel, John Grisham's novel. When I look at it, it was John Grisham's novel. I know John Grisham. I read John Grisham novel as well, but it was written in in German, right? Even novel was translated into 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 Germany. So the the rate of translation was very rapid uh, in many of those countries. So you cannot compare to say that you know, we have to learn our native language when the educational books were not translated into Malay, and we have deficit of what we call a vocabularies. No, the Malay language, yeah, okay. The Malay language has deficit of vocabularies. So we can we can we can translate. Many of these words, right? So that's that's a real problem. Yeah, we are not as good as Indonesians. Indonesians manage to translate. Um, even they 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 have Latin in, in they learn Latin in in the medicine as well, for example. So you know it's different. So you have to look at that. Uh, in order to progress, to me, is that you must be able to capture the 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 what you call the knowledge of today's world. And the knowledge of today's world basically revolves around the language, the English language, and you have to master that language basically in order for you to advance. And uh, yeah, I know we have five more minutes after I finish this. Um, yeah, this this what this uh, question about politics of fear. What is uh, PH doing, right? So to me, like you know, like uh, even though I think that the government were, is trying to try and alleviate this politics of fear, I think that uh, it, they are not going anywhere. You know, every day, almost every day, they will come up with new issues, and every day, even the issue of Zakir Naik is has been turned to become a political issue. You know, it's very sad. This issue has been turned to become a political issue, and uh, once a very moderate uh, mufti had turned to, you know, had issued a statement which was regarded to be, you know, very a uh, kind of right wing statement, right? So I don't know. I think you know it's going to be very difficult. I think the way to do it is basically to address the real issue that that has caused all these apprehensions and anxieties. And that is the economic issue, and that's more important. And uh, I go to this um, the by Yuko, right? You asked about uh, whether um, this policy that favors the Malay will change or not. I would say that you know, as I mentioned in the in the um, I mean, from my slides just now, and I showed you the slides, 
that you know the bulk of the problems lies with the B40 and the majority of B40s are uh, Malays. Whether we like it or not, we have to, uh, even though we say needs based, but it's also basically, it's not so much of race based, but basically we're going to address this race, race issue. Because the bulk of the, the lower income uh, population in, in, in Malaysia would still be the Malays. And, uh, and, um, and I think that uh, uh, the Chinese, even though it forms uh, only about 28% uh, of the population, but I think you know, they are much well to do in terms of economy and uh, they have uh, strong willpower to survive. And they are very resilient and I do not think that, you know, that uh, their position is going to be compromised at all. Uh, even though some of the policies might seem to be favouring the Malays more than, than the Chinese because they are very resilient, right? And I don't see, I don't think that it's going to affect them at all. And uh, the final question, uh, oh, I'm right? Oh, Sharon, yeah, you. You asked a question about this, uh, about NGO, right? I think that, you know, like, um, even though they have not but us from like previously, you know, we could not have our events, our talks at the International Islamic University. Nowadays, we they, they have not bought us, so you no, know, we have access to those places. But unfortunately, there are certain rules and regulations that were there before. They have not managed to kind of change it. For example, like the book banning, you said, uh, three of our books that were banned were still there, the banning was still there, right? the ban was still there, and, and you know they have not lifted the ban of our books, and it's still going to the appeal process and so on and so forth. And I think from the look of it, I I do not think that you know that they have done a lot to improve the, how do I say, the, uh, their policies towards uh, towards uh, civil societies, and and I think civil societies must remain active. You know, even though the civil societies are not as antagonistic towards the government as before, as Najib's government. You know, but uh, but I think that we have to address certain issues uh, of the current Pakistan government, and uh, we have to do it without fear or favor, and that's the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farouk. It was slightly uh, over time. So uh, thank you very much for the interesting discussions and taking so many questions from your audience. Um, so on that note, let's put our hands together once again for Dr. Farouk.